Welcome to Hawthorne University, everybody. I'm Paula Bartholomew, and I'm glad that you're getting settled. And I'm just going to share a few updates before we begin our interview and our webinar. It's our first one of the year. We've got David Crow with us today. Uh, so I'm going to get started and just remind you that our last webinar was December 6th. It was on medicinal mushrooms, and we had Allison Gardner and Mary Winslow with us. We recorded that webinar, and we'll be recording this one too, so you'll have access to them from our website under archived webinars. Uh, I want to let you know about All About Alumni. That's another online event that we do here at Hawthorne. And this is where we showcase Hawthorne graduates for a 30-minute segment where they give a presentation, they share their success stories, and really what challenges them, what they've learned from, and to encourage the rest of us. Um, and so I, I hope that you'll, you'll join me. This is an opportunity for you to be able to ask questions directly to the graduates as well. These presentations air live at noon Pacific time on the first Wednesday of the month. And um, on December 7th, we had Wendy Borden give a terrific presentation on her Revive and Thrive program. And up next, tomorrow is the first uh, Wednesday of the month of January, and we've got Hawthorne graduate Rebecca Katz with us. So I hope you'll tune in with us live tomorrow, January 4th at noon. And as usual, we'll have a survey for you to complete after the webinar ends. It's really an opportunity for you to be able to give us feedback on our presentations and let us know what you'd like to learn more about in upcoming webinars. And really, the survey is really a way of you talking to us directly. So I hope you'll take some time for that, and thank you very much for it in advance. And with that, I'd like to welcome David Krull with us. David, welcome to Hawthorne University. Thank you. I will redirect this a little bit and um, just once again say what a pleasure it is for me to welcome David Crow for the part one of um, his presentation on essential oils and today we have the introduction to the safe use of essential oils. And I'm really excited about this presentation because it's being offered with live video, not the typical PowerPoint that we usually do. So before we get started, I want to tell you a little bit about today's presentation and David Crow, because the interest in essential oils is growing rapidly, but there's so many, there's too many misconceptions and misunderstandings about how to use them safely and effectively. So in this webinar, David Crow is going to discuss various methods for incorporating essential oils safely for a wide range of uses. And I want to let you know a little bit more about David Crow before he starts. He's an acupuncturist and an herbalist with over 30 years' experience. He's the author of several books, including one of my favorite, In Search of the Medicine Buddha. It's a book about his studies of Tibetan and Ayurvedic medicine while he's in the Himalayas. David's a well-known lecturer in the field of natural medicine, and his work is largely focused on the synthesis of botanical medicine, ecology, and spirituality. He's the founder of Floricopia, a company that supports ecologically sustainable agriculture through the production of essential oils and aromatic treasures. David, um, I'm sure you've got plenty to do and talk about, so I'm going to turn it over to you now. Okay, thank you. You bet. Uh, is, is my uh, camera working okay? It seems to be freezing up on my side. Is it all right? It's, it's beautiful on our end. Okay, great. So welcome to everybody, and thank you, and Paula especially, thank you very much for the invitation, and James for the technical support. Uh, and yes, you already started the personal philosophy introduction just by giving my background there a little bit. And so we'll go ahead and just jump into our topic of essential oils, and this teaching in my mind uh, is really inseparable from the philosophy that I have about natural medicine, because essential oils uh, can be viewed a lot of different ways. We can look at them as as just chemical compounds. We can look at them through the standpoint of chemistry. We can look at them through the lens of economics and through the lens of agriculture. Uh, we can look at them through the lens of history. We can look at them through uh, the lens of botany. Uh, there's so many different ways that we could look at essential oils and the way that I look at them is very much influenced by my background in Ayurvedic and Chinese medicine. And so uh, when we talk about essential oils, then I'm going to be including a lot of the concepts from Ayurvedic and Chinese medicine because that's a very good model for understanding 
what essential oils are and how they work and how they should be used properly and not used and the kind of dangers that they can have. So one of the places that I usually start in talking about essential oils for people who are both familiar and not familiar with the, the subject uh, is just to ask a simple question, what's in the bottle? Because if we know what essential oils are, then it gives us a lot of respect for them. And therefore, uh, the way that I like to describe them actually is according to the language of Ayurvedic and Chinese medicine, uh, as well as some chemistry and, of course, the therapeutic aspect of them is very important. So the talk will be divided into uh, three main parts. Uh, the first thing that I'd like to share is the philosophical background, the cosmology of the essential oils, how we can understand essential oils at a, at a cosmological basis, and that gives us a lot of information about how to use them correctly. Uh, then we're going to have to get into some of the uh, unpleasant topics about essential oils because they're being widely misused, a lot of fraudulent claims, a lot of misinformation being passed around on the internet, and as a result a lot of people are getting injured from them. There's a lot of adverse reactions happening. And we don't want this to happen. We don't want people to get injured from essential oils, and we don't want the FDA to close down the availability of essential oils also. And so we have to address how to use them safely. And that will be the third primary topic, will be how to use essential oils in a safe and effective way so that we don't hurt ourselves or our family or loved ones. And so I'll just go ahead and answer my question. Uh, what's in the bottle? And in order to answer this, uh, we start with the basic question of, well, where do essential oils come from? And they come from aromatic plants. They come from only a small percentage of the plant world, actually, and that is about 10% of the plant world produces aromatic plants, and I think everybody would be familiar with uh, that list right off, uh, including aromatic herbs like oregano and thyme, a lot of the cooking spices, cinnamon, clove, cardamom, uh, lots of aromatic roots like um, vetiver root, ginger root, things like that. So they come from a variety of plant species and they come from a variety of parts of the plant, but only about 10% of the plant world gives us aromatic plants that have essential oils. Now, the essential oils are distilled from the plant, and there's a variety of ways that this is done, but the most common is through steam distillation. And to do steam distillation, the plant, is, the plant material is put into a still, and typically there is a source of steam underneath it that is either pumped in or there's water that's heated. And the steam rises through the plant material and comes out the top of the still and then passes through a condensing unit and the steam liberates the aromatic molecules, carries them upward into the condensing tube and then the condensing tube transforms it back into water again. And the water has the aromatic molecules in it. So it's a form of extracting active compounds from plants using a solvent, and the solvent in this case is steam, which is a non-toxic solvent, and the end result is an aromatic water. And as the uh, water is accumulating in the beaker, the condensing beaker, uh, the molecules of essential oil start to get together. They're very uh, small micro uh, particles, uh, micro droplets at first, and they have an affinity to each other and they find each other in the water and they become larger and larger drops until they float upward. And this is an important thing to remember when we talk about the cosmology and the philosophy of how to use these because oil is lighter than water and so it will separate out and it will float to the top of the the water, and therefore in the 
collecting vessel, what you will find is the aromatic water at the end and the essential oil floating on the top. And the essential oil is then separated off. And that has no water in it. It's just pure essential oil molecules, aromatic volatile molecules. And the water that's left, however, still has some of those molecules in it, and that's what we call a hydrosol. And the hydrosol smells and tastes and works therapeutically like the essential oils because it has a very low concentration of molecules still floating around in it that can't find each other because of the dilution. So that's a brief overview of the distillation process, extracting the aromatic molecules from the plants. But now we can look at it from the viewpoint of Ayurvedic and Chinese medicine and, and look at the cosmology of what has just happened here and this is taking us back to the general philosophy of um, what this medicine really is and so therefore if we ask okay so what's what's in the bottle well we have the the first definition which is that it is a bottle full of liquid and that liquid is uh, similar to the water element. It looks like water, but it's not water, it's a liquid though. And so we look at this liquid and we can say, okay, it's distilled aromatic volatile molecules. But now comes the basic question of, well, where did that actually come from? And we can trace this back a step at a time and arrive at a very interesting cosmological view about herbal medicine in general that's very important to remember. So first of all, we learned that it's uh, extracted from plants, from a particular family of aromatic plants. And then we can ask the question, well, why did those plants make this oil? Why do these particular types of aromatic plants produce this type of molecule, this family of aromatic molecules? We can also ask, what did they make this oil from? Because we've extracted this substance from the plants, but we don't know why they made it and we don't know what they made it from. And so let's look at the whole process now of how life works in the botanical world and why we ended up with this substance. And that tells us a lot about how to use it and what it's good for. Now, uh, if you... Uh, trace back the origin of an essential oil, it goes back to a plant, but there's something happening in the plant that's producing it. And we can ask the question, what, what is it making the essential oil out of? And so the plant is metabolizing its environment. And that's the simplest way to answer it. And when you say, well, what does that mean? It means that the plant is being driven by photosynthesis from solar energy. And it's also influenced by the lunar energy as well. A lot of plants are very sensitive to the lunar cycle as well as to the diurnal solar cycle. So we know first of all that all the plants are under the influence of the sun and the moon. Well, if we think about it, what that means is that in order for the plants to produce the essential oils that there has to be a solar and a lunar component. Now it starts to get interesting because if you say, well, what's in the bottle? Well, you can say that there's sunlight and moonlight that are in the bottle. And this is very important because the most basic diagnostic parameters for classical Asian medicine and lots of other medical, traditional ethno-botanical medical systems as well, classify all disease as hot or cold. And they therefore classify all treatments and foods and herbal medicines as having a heating stimulating kind of effect or a cooling relaxing kind of effect. So therefore we can see that the essential oils can be classified that way as well. We, we see that there are basically really hot stimulant spicy oils like cinnamon and oregano or there are cooling relaxant types of oils like the flowers, lavender and rose and things like that. And so Right away, we start to understand the cosmological relevance of these systems to therapeutic applications. And also, it starts to give us the philosophical framework for using these cosmologically. So we have an essential oil bottle, and we know that the plants are driven by sunlight and moonlight. Well, great. 
And what are they actually doing? Well, they're metabolizing. And what are they metabolizing? They are metabolizing the five elements of the environment. Now, this is exactly the same as what human beings are doing, except that we have an opposite pattern of respiration with the plants. Otherwise, we are biologically very identical. So what that means that the, is that the plant is somewhere out in the field or the tree is out in the forest. And what is it doing? It's absorbing nutrition. It is metabolizing sunlight. It is breathing. And it is drinking. And those four elements, earth, water, fire, and air, which are the Ayurvedic elemental terminology, those four elements are circulating through channels of space. And so now we have the Ayurvedic cosmology. We have the sun and the moon, and we have the five elements, earth, water, fire, air, space, and those are all happening in the plant. And so we can say then that the plants are accumulating different degrees of solar energy, and that might make the herbs hot, and the plants are accumulating different degrees of lunar energy, which could make the plants more cooling at a therapeutic level. And this is not just esoteric. If you put cinnamon oil directly on your skin, it will burn. It's sunlight, okay? It's pure solar energy. Lavender, on the other hand, will cool an inflammation. And so this polarity of sun and moon is very practical, very real. And then we have the five elements, and the different plants are accumulating the five elements in different concentrations. And so a vetiver root, for example, is going to come out of the earth, and it will be distilled, and it will, the oil will actually be very dark and it will smell like dirt, and it will be very thick and viscous, and it will have a soft kind of soothing effect on the skin, and what do you think its overall effect is? To add more earth element to the body. It's grounding, it's calming, it's stabilizing. So this is how we learn to think in Ayurveda is elementally. So other oils are going to represent water, and other oils are going to represent fire, and other oils are going to represent air, and others will represent space. But that's because the plants are metabolizing those elements from the environment. Literally, the elements of the environment become the aromatic molecules. So now, we ask the question, all right, the oil is made of sunlight and moonlight and the five elements, uh, but why? Why does the plant produce essential oils? And this is crucial to understand also because it is directly related to what we're going to use the essential oils for. Well, if we look at the botany side of it, what we see is that this 10% of the plant world has developed a very interesting immunological defensive strategy. And that's what essential oils are. They are actually the immune system of the plants. That's their primary function. The essential oils at a botanical metabolic or a biochemical level are called secondary metabolic compounds. Secondary meaning that they are not responsible for the primary activities of the life force in the body, the primary metabolic pathways and so forth, but it has a very important secondary effect. And the secondary metabolic pathways in aromatic plants have two or three major functions. And the overriding most basic function that these molecules have is to protect the plant. And that's uh, easy to understand. For example, a lot of the essential oils of conifer trees, the conifer trees produce these oils to protect themselves from invasion from beetles or from being eaten by deer and so forth. But all the essential oils, whether it's uh, lavender or any of the spices, tree oils, root oils, flower oils, any type of oil, we see that it plays a defensive role in the life of the plant. Now that's important to understand because that's what we use the essential oils for also, is for defensive purposes. So what we say then is that the essential oils are the extracted immune system of the plant. So now we have a new definition of what's in the bottle. It is the molecular compounds of the plant's immune system, literally. All right, now, that's the why. Of why do these plants produce these essential oils? And there's other reasons, but the, that's the primary reason that the essential oils are produced 
uh, that is in common for all the oils, which is defensive. Another major reason, which is which is there for a lot of oils, is also um, attractant, and that's found mostly in the flower oils. And the flower oils are emitting these pulsations of aroma. You know that flowers open and close, and the opening and closing of the flowers follows the sun and the moon. Some open at night, some open during the day, some open in the morning, some open in the evening, and so forth. Well, when the flowers open, there's an invisible aura of aromatic molecules that goes to a certain diffusivity range as well. And that's why, if you are out walking at night, you will smell the night blooming jasmine blooming because the flowers are emitting an aura. And this aura pulsates as the flower opens and closes during a 24-hour cycle. And that's another aspect of why the plants produce the essential oils, and that's a signaling mechanism to attract the pollinators. Well, that also has some relevance to us in aromatherapy because one of the major uses of the flower oils is perfumery. So these are a few interesting little uh, introductory points about why plants produce essential oils. That's a why, and we, we know uh, uh, the answer to what, uh, what goes into it. Now we have to ask another question, well, how? How does it do that? So we know that the what of what is in the bottle is sunlight and moonlight and earth, water, fire, air, and space. And we know why, which is basically immunological intelligence and reproductive intelligence. But now we have to ask another question. Well, what actually does that? How does that work inside the plant? And this is probably the most profound aspect of why we use essential oils. And that's metabolism. The plant metabolizes. It creates these molecules out of the raw elements of the environment. And it creates these molecules according to its own genetic structures, its own genetic programming, its you know, unique species, its unique needs, its unique abilities, and so forth. And so every species of plant has a whole range of different compounds that it produces for itself. And if we look at what is doing that, there's different words that we could use. We could say, well, it's, it's genetics. And you could point to the DNA. And you could say, well, it's the DNA that's doing it. That's a modern scientific sort of mechanistic view. The view that I like, which includes the DNA, includes, includes metabolism and DNA in this, but is more uh, mystical, spiritual, and uh, all-encompassing, really, as we say life force. And the two terms that we use from uh, Asian medicine, we use the term prana, and we use the term chi. Now, these terms are very interesting because Qi has many aspects of connotating breath and vapor and fragrance and smell and atmosphere and clouds and life force and vitality and spirit and sort of ephemeral life force energy. And all of these things very directly explain how an essential oil works and is energetically. An essential oil is very much a concentrated form of life force. And the same can be said about prana. Now, the nice thing about prana, you know, the term prana that is very important, is that in addition to all of those connotations with the word chi, it also means intelligence. And this is very important to understand when we're talking about essential oils because the essential oil molecules are actually the reflection of the plant's intelligence, and specifically a very ancient intelligence. If you look at plants and you look at how old they are, they go way back before humans got here. And a plant uh, like roses, this is one example I know, roses have only been around for a, mil a mere 30 million years. Well, that's a long time before Homo sapiens got here. And that means that when we extract rose oil from the rose flowers, that oil has an ancestry that's at least 30 million years. And lots of other plants, like conifers, they go back much farther than that. Conifer oils could go back 100 million years or more. 
So this is another thing that we add to the answer of what's in the bottle is we say that it's a very, very ancient immunological intelligence. And that immunological intelligence is there for a reason. It's there for an, an adaptive reason. And it has evolved over a long period of time. And so we say that it is an evolutionary immunological intelligence. Now, that concludes the introduction to what's in the bottle. And that's also the underlying philosophy. Paula, to answer your question, what is my philosophy? It is to view plants in a cosmological way so that we understand our biological unity with the deep, profound intelligence that is all around us. Therefore, we say, what's in the bottle? We say, well, it is a liquid, but it has a tendency to burn. And so we would say that it's a, a liquid with a fire element in it. Uh, it has a vaporous nature, so it has an affinity to the air element and therefore our respiratory system. And therefore the space element, meaning the channels of space in our, in our respiratory system. And so we would say that it is a uh, liquid that contains earth, water, fire, air, and space that has been created by the ancient evolutionary pranic immunological intelligence of the plants that has made this from the forces of the sun and the moon and the five elements in its environment. So that's the overview of what is an essential oil. And now that allows us to take this directly into the therapeutic applications and how to use it safely and who should use it and who should, should not use it. But this language of the five elements and life force gives us a really good model to understand how to use all herbs because it's a kind of organoleptic model, meaning that it's something we can understand at a sensory level. We don't have to study chemistry. We don't have to have expensive analytic equipment because if you put an essential oil directly on the skin uh, and it's a spice oil, for example, you don't dilute it properly, there's a very li high likelihood that it will burn your skin. You'll get contact dermatitis. Well, that's really easy to understand that basically it's too much fire element. So this language of the five elements makes it very easy then to incorporate into a therapeutic application. Okay, so that's the first introduction. Now we can move to a general discussion here. Uh, let me look at my notes here. I covered all of the main things that I wanted to about the cosmology, but I also want to go back and touch on one very important point here, and that is the immune system of the plants. This tells us why we want to use these essential oils and how they can be used and for what. A very simple definition of herbology that I like to use is that we extract the compounds that the plants produce for themselves and we use them for parallel functions that the plants use these compounds for. We can ask a basic question, well, how is that? How, how is it that, that we can use these compounds that the plants made for themselves? Well, it turns out that there's a lot of physiological and anatomical parallels between the human body and the plant body. One of them is that at a basic elemental level, we're doing the same thing the plants are doing. We are circulating the five elements through the four elements of earth, water, fire, and air through channels of space. That's the same thing the plants are doing now. The only real difference is that the plants are directly solar powered and we are indirectly solar powered and we need to consume the plants to extract the solar energy that they have put into the carbohydrate foundation of the food chain through photosynthesis. And therefore our respiratory system is breathing in an opposite pattern with the plants. And this is a very deep spiritual kind of contemplation about our biological unity, but we can take it a step further and we can look at the immune system of the plants and we can see that the essential oils are produced primarily for protection and that one of the things that the essential oils are definitely known for now and have been known for actually for a very long time, possibly tens of thousands of years, uh, is that the plants have antimicrobial powers. And this is very well documented now. 
uh, by scientific research, and this is one of the main reasons we want to use them, is because we're coming to the end of the antibiotic era. And this is very uh, tragic. This is not a good thing. Uh, it's a natural consequence, however, of mutating, stimulating the evolutionary capacity of the pathogens through the overuse of antibiotics. Now, when we look at the research, we see that there's a lot of research happening by a lot of individuals and labs and companies who are trying to find uh, the antibacterial, antiviral, and antifungal properties of the essential oils. And guess what they're finding? Almost all essential oils, practically every essential oil that I have studied, has documentation that the essential oils are strongly antimicrobial. And not just strongly antimicrobial, but they are also strongly antimicrobial in very low dilutions against resistant pathogens. This is incredibly important to keep in mind. Now let me just give a simple example. One study, I like to quote this, it's very important. The study came out, it was maybe about eight or nine years ago, came out of Australia. A group of doctors did a research project to test tea tree, which is a very well researched antimicrobial oil. They tested tea tree against MRSA, methicillin or multi-resistant Staphylococcus aureus. And what did they find? 67 strains, not just one, one type of MRSA, 67 strains of MRSA were tested in petri dishes and they found, guess what they found? They used a dilution, 0.5% essential oil. That's 99.5% water. 99.5% water, 0.5% tea tree eradicated all 67 strains of MRSA. Now that's incredibly uh, effective and it's incredibly important for us to understand as well. Now this is one of the things I'm going to address. I'm going to unpack this a little bit more in just a few minutes because that's one of the main reasons why we want to use essential oils is to protect ourselves from microbial pathogens. However, we have to understand the limitations of translating the information from a petri dish uh, into a human body. It's not quite that simple. Okay, so now let me see if there's anything else that I wanted to um, touch on here briefly. Okay, let's go ahead and start talking about how to use them safely. And this is going to actually take a little introduction because we're going to have to deal with a few unpleasant things about essential oils and specifically about marketing and the internet and making money from selling essential oils. Now, this is a very interesting, unique cultural thing that's happening. And that is that uh, essential oils are becoming very, very popular very quickly. And there's several important reasons for that. Some are positive and some are negative. And if we understand the general social context of how essential oils are uh, emerging, then we can understand some of the uh, false information that's being given about them and therefore we can be very safe about how we use them. So the thing that's really interesting about essential oils here in the West, especially in the United States, is that they have been introduced to a mass uh, population through multi-level marketing. Now, I like to say that essential oils basically go with anything. They go with massage really well. They go with meditation. They go with perfumery. They go with yoga. They go with acupuncture. Uh, they go with the home. There are so many ways that essential oils can be used, but unfortunately, I find that they don't mix well with marketing. And the reason for that is because they're so concentrated. And that means a couple of different things. First, because they are so concentrated, that means there's a very high risk in consuming them improperly. That means taking them internally or putting them undiluted on the skin can cause serious adverse reactions and, and is causing serious adverse reactions. And the problem with that <clears throat> is that when it comes to marketing, you have to sell them. And so you can sell somebody a bottle of essential oil and I've seen this over and over in my travels and doing events. I'll do an event and People will buy some oils and I'll come back a couple of years later and people still have the same oil. That's because you don't need very much. So 
if you mix marketing and you need to make a living, you're trying to sell uh, the oils to make money, the, the best strategy would be to tell people to consume them in all kinds of ways as quickly as possible. And that's where all of this misinformation is coming. And so people are being told, just put them all over you. You know, pour them on your skin. Apply these to the skin of your children. Put these on infants, okay? And there's all kinds of things that are being told to people. And there's a very high risk of dermotoxic reaction. And as a matter of fact, many people are being hospitalized because of that unwise advice. So the first general rule then is don't use them unless you dilute it in a carrier oil or you dilute them in a diffuser or you dilute them somehow. Because there's a very high likelihood that if you put the oils directly on the skin that you could burn yourself or the skin of somebody else and especially for children. Now the real problem is coming because people are being told to take them internally. Now before we touch on this, I just want to say that there's another aspect of the essential oil industry that's very complicated and that is quality control. Now basically the way we can think about aromatherapy and essential oils is that we take a huge amount of plant material and we put it into a still and we distill out a very small amount of oil. Now in some cases this ratio is really quite extreme. For example, it takes about 7,000 pounds of rose petals to get one liter of oil. Well, when the yield is so low and the agricultural work uh, is so extensive and so much plant material is needed, then what do you think the end result is? The result is obviously that the oil is going to be extremely expensive and that's why a liter of true pure organic rose oil is going to run somewhere between ten and fifteen thousand dollars. That's wholesale. Now, what do you think that's going to do? Well, a common phenomenon, this is a very easy way to visualize it, this much oil is produced on the market actually. This much oil is found at the retail level. So what does that mean? That means that this much is not oil. It might be stretched with a carrier oil and a lot of people notice that if they have a expensive flower oil like rose that a few years later it smells rancid. Well that's because it was put into a carrier oil like jojoba. Uh, another thing that happens is that a lot of synthetic aroma fragrance compounds are added in. Now this isn't new. This is as old as expensive perfumery. There were recipes going back hundreds of years of how to make fake rose oil. But the problem is that now it's based on uh, petrochemicals that are not so nice to ingest. And so this is one of the things that we see and a common question that comes is, well, what oil, what company has good oils? Well, I'll answer it in advance and that is it's not the company, it's the species of the plant that makes the difference. So for example, eucalyptus oil is produced abundantly on the market and it's low cost and there's practically no adulteration of it because there's no need for adulteration of it. On the other hand, something like sandalwood oil is now so endangered and so highly controlled and so rare, true Santalum alba from South India is now so rare that I was told by my mentor, a chemist in India, who analyzes, he claims, a thousand samples of sandalwood every year at his company. He said that almost all of them are fake. Now this is information that we need to know about the industry when we start using the oils. We need to understand that every company is going to say 100% pure, 100% organic, 100% natural, but it's not true. You must know each species. You must know its availability and you must know the industry problems associated with that species. Now let's go back to what I was saying about safe use. Why is this important? Because a lot of people are being told take the oil in internally. And some things are getting a lot of information or a lot of exposure now, like frankincense oil. It's getting a lot of publicity. Claims are being made about it saying that it will cure cancer. Well, there's no evidence that I have seen that it will cure cancer in a human body. What it will do is it will inhibit 
certain specific cancer cell lines in a petri dish. That's a very different subject. But because frankincense has now become so popular, lots of people are taking it internally. And it's one of the oils that is widely contaminated. So this is why I say that you must know a lot more than just internet medicine before you take essential oils internally. Now, can you take essential oils internally? I can already hear people objecting to this. Yes, you can, but you need a lot of information about each species. You need to know the dose. You need to know the condition. You need to know the length of time to take it. You need to know the right way to administer it. You need to know the correct diagnosis of what's happening, especially with the person's digestive system, because these can be very inflammatory. Well, if you know all that stuff, guess what you're doing? You're practicing medicine. And that's OK if you know how to do that. But a lot of people are just being told, just take this. Now, let's look at another example here. And this will put it into context. And uh, we can look at herbal medicine in general as a pyramid. And the foundation of the pyramid is our diet, actually. Well, we could go even further. We could say it's the five elements of the environment. Because we can use earth, water, fire, air, and space for healing. We can use the environment for healing. Next comes our food. And we can use food for healing, or it can make us sick, depending on what we're using, how we're using it. And we need some information and knowledge about how to eat correctly. And we need some good sources in order to eat correctly as well. So that's the foundation. Now the next level up are the food grade herbs. And those are things like peppermint, tea, and chamomile tea, or using uh, spices in our cooking and so forth. This level requires a little bit more education, but not much. It doesn't take a lot of education to know that you can take a Tulsi tea bag and make Tulsi tea, and it's good for your immune system. But you need a little bit of information, but it's not going to hurt you. Now, when you go up to the next level, what do you see? Clinical herbs, and mostly, that big jump happens when we go to tinctures, which is an extract. Okay. So when you start getting into tinctures, alcohol extracts of botanical medicine, suddenly you need a lot more education about how to use them, the proper dose, the diagnosis of the patient, the length of time, the health condition, and so forth. You don't want to just be consuming tinctures of anything without more education, even if these herbs are now popular superfoods. You don't want to be con consuming concentrated extracts of any of the superfoods, maca, reishi, any of these types of things, especially if you're on medications because they can have adverse reactions. So this is where we have to get a much higher level of knowledge and education because it, it becomes more concentrated. So as we go up this pyramid of concentration, we're also going up the pyramid of requirements for education. And so when you get to the very top of the pyramid, guess what you find? Essential oils. And so essential oils are the most concentrated form of botanical medicine. And therefore, they require the highest level of education in order to use them safely. All right, now that's the basic overview. Now let's cover quickly some further information. How are they best used, and when should we not use them? Well, OK, here's the nature of essential oils. Herbal medicine we consume internally, for the most part. That means that it's going to work through the digestive system, through the liver, and then affect the entire body. Essential oils work in three main ways, and this will guide us in the safe application. First of all, they can work on the skin. And there are some specific applications for skin healing purposes. There are a lot of essential oils that are actually good for the skin, uh, especially when they're combined with things like carrier oils that are also good for the skin. So essential oils have a direct contact with the skin and direct therapeutic benefits for the skin. Where else do they come in direct contact with the body? Obviously, through inhalation. And so therefore, one of the most important ways to use essential oils is for respiratory conditions. And in many ways, essential oils and aromatherapy work better for respiratory conditions than using the herbs internally. And that's because 
when we breathe the essential oils in, and I'll give you a couple simple examples. You put a couple drops on the palms, rub them together, breathe it. Don't overdo it. You can irritate your sinuses, but that's a very good way to clear your sinuses if you're congested, and that's a direct treatment for the respiratory system for colds and flus. Or you can put a couple drops on a pot of hot water if you're really congested and you have a cold or a flu, and then you cover your head with a towel. You breathe the steam. Close your eyes so you don't burn your eyes. Don't put your face too close to it. Or for long-term, regular daily use, you put some essential oils in a diffuser. And that puts the aromatic molecules of the plant's immune system into the atmosphere, and we breathe it into our respiratory system. So that's the concept here, is that we're breathing the aromatic molecules, which are the immune system of the plant, directly into the respiratory system. That's aroma therapy, therapy with aromas. And that means respiratory. So essential oils, then, are very good for all kinds of respiratory conditions congestion, inflammation, colds, flus, upper respiratory viral conditions, sinusitis, allergies, many, many things can be treated directly with essential oils very effectively. And so that's a good way to think about it. Now the next major category of therapeutic function, and this is the third category, is the limbic system. And that's because when we inhale the frag, it goes through the olfactory nerve to our brain. And how far is the brain from the outside world? This far, it is this far, the link, the, the thickness of the cranium at the uh, cribiform plate. The brain is sitting on top of our sinus cavities and the olfactory nerves pass through the skull into the brain. And so our brain is this close to the outside world and this is very important to remember medically. A lot of studies are now showing that, uh, that it's environmental contamination, such as air pollution, that's actually contributing to neurodegenerative conditions of the brain, such as Alzheimer's. We're finding metallic particles in our brains from smog. That's because the brain's only that far away. Now, that's also how we get the wonderful effects from aromatherapy. Now, at this level, we have to ask, well, what does the limbic system do? It does some very interesting things. It, balances our biorhythms, for example. Hmm. Does that make you think of anything? How about flowers opening and closing? And so when the flowers are opening and they are pulsating this invisible aura of attractant molecules, that can be distilled at that particular time. And energetically, then, we can say that that essential oil of that flower is actually a distilled biorhythm. That's very interesting at a therapeutic level, because then when we inhale that, it goes to our limbic system, which controls our biorhythms, and guess what the flower oils do? They help us to balance our biorhythms. How do they do that specifically? They help people to relax and get good sleep. So the flower oils then are a major way to help the limbic system to calm down stress. But it's not just stress and biorhythms. It's the whole range of emotions that are connected through the olfactory system. And the olfactory system, the way it's linked to the limbic system and the endocrine system, fragrance has a direct powerful effect on our memory and specifically on our emotional memory. And emotional memories have a lot to do with our levels of stress and anxiety and our biorhythms and our ability to sleep. And so therefore we can link all of these things together and we can say that this is another way that the plant intelligence, the pranic intelligence of the plant, through gathering the sun and the moon and creating these molecules out of the five elements, all this energy, all this molecular energy all this intelligence, cosmological, elemental intelligence, botanical intelligence, all goes into our consciousness as well as into our respiratory system. So these are the two most important ways to use essential oils for the respiratory system and for our consciousness, mood, and emotions. Okay, so let me give you a little bit more information here. I've touched on all the major points, but I, I wanted to mention a few practical things for you about dilutions and a few words about children and 
uh, so forth. Let me pull up these files here. Let me just give you now the uh, specific information about how you do want to use them. You know, there's a paradox with using essential oils, and that is on the one hand, they are so concentrated, we need a very high level of knowledge of how to use them medically. But on the other hand, with simple safety guidelines, we can use these all the time safely in our families with very little risk. And so I'll just give you those guidelines. So the basic concept here, we gather a huge amount of plant material, we put it into a still, we extract a little bit of an oil. That oil is not biocompatible. It's not water soluble. It's not going to get into the cells. It's going to irritate the gastric mucosa if you take it internally. And I'll mention here <clears throat> one of the most misleading statements that's made is that inflammatory reactions, adverse inflammatory reactions are detox. That's nonsense. If you burn yourself with an essential oil, that's called contact dermatitis. It's not detox. Okay. If you give yourself gastritis because you're consuming essential oils internally, that's not detox. That's a toxic reaction. Okay. So the oil is not biocompatible. So what do we do then? We have this little bit of essential oil. We have to dilute it. All right. So the major ways to dilute it, I've given you a few already. I'll just review these. All the ways that you can safely start using essential oils. And yes, you should use them. They have great benefit. In the next talk, I'm going to go into the therapeutic applications. This is really just how to use them safely. One, a couple drops of the oil on the palms. Now, keep in mind, be reasonable. The flower oils are the uh, safest starting point here. Lavender oil, geranium oil, rose oil, uh, neroli, orange blossom oil, or some of the conifer oils. Spur or eucalyptus. This is really good for the respiratory system. Just a couple drops. Do it lightly. Best overall way, put the oils in a diffuser. That's the best way to use the oils that make them user-friendly for the home. Very safe. It's not going to overstimulate you. It's not going to hurt anything. So diffuser is really the best way to do it. Now baths are also a good way, but they're problematic because when you put the oil on the water, the oil is hydrophobic. It means it floats on the water, but it's lipophilic. It loves to get on your skin. So maximum three to five drops is what I recommend. You don't have to put 20 or 30 drops, especially of an irritant oil. Use the flower oils at this level of education. Those are the safest, three to five, and they go a long ways. Stir them around, or you could also put them in an emulsifier like milk. You could put a few drops of essential oils in milk. It will emulsify. Put the milk in the bath. That's always nice, too. Okay? Or you can mix the essential oils with salt as a dispersing agent, so you, you add your your Epsom salt, lavender, essential oil mixture to the bath. Okay, that's another way to use them safely. Another way, compresses, and these are especially helpful for the lungs. Just take a hot, wet towel and put a few drops of eucalyptus or conifer oils on it. Put that on the chest and breathe it. That's also a nice way. And I mentioned the facial steam already. And the most commonly used way is the massage oil blend. And I'll just give you the specific concentrations here. It's very easy to remember. 1% dilution is 6 drops per ounce of a carrier oil, 1%. Okay. Now, most general purposes start at about 1% to 2%. So that means for general safety guidelines, just to start with, that means 6 to 12 drops per ounce of carrier oil, of most essential oils, will be fine. Now, you can go up a lot higher with certain oils, but that's a, that's a bigger subject. It takes more time, and that's why I said you need more education. You need to know each species of oil. There's no general rules. You need to know each species of oil. I, I will give over a few general rules about and working with children. Now there's a big list of oils that are toxic and should not be used at all during pregnancy. And those include things uh, like 
birch and wintergreen oils that you find in liniments for injuries, fennel oil, sage, pennyroyal, uh, a lot of the lemon scented essential oils and so forth. So there's a lot of essential oils that you should stay away from, but rather than giving you the list of what you should not do, because it's more oils than what you should do, I'll just make a few recommendations here. In general, it's best to avoid all forms of essential oils in the first trimester. And this is partly for political reasons also, because if the woman has a propensity to uh, miscarriages, you don't want anything uh, stimulating, any likelihood of that happening, herb-wise, treatment-wise, aromatherapy-wise. Once the pregnancy is past the first trimester, simple essential oils like lavender, and geranium, the flower oils, the roly orange blossom, rose, things like that can be safely brought in for gentle massage. And aromatherapy massage is very helpful during pregnancy. It alleviates a lot of discomfort, anxiety, depression, back pain. You know, uh, it's difficult, especially as the pregnancy develops further. And in the last trimester, aromatherapy is actually relatively safe to use overall. Aromatherapy during childbirth has a lot of evidence backing it up, and in general, it's the same group of oils that I just gave you. The flower oils are found to be very, very beneficial during childbirth for relaxation. But then we have to start all over again. We say, don't use essential oils around infants. And I like to be on the safe side and just say, wait until up to two years. Now, there are some specialized ways that you can use essential oils before that. For example, you can put a little rose oil in a carrier oil for uh, infant massage. That's pretty safe, but it's very, very limited. Lots of oils that kids should stay away from. And so really, aromatherapy should be brought in uh, at least after two or three years, and then you can start to do uh, aromatherapy in the diffuser at home. That's quite safe, and it has very wonderful effects for kids also, both for boosting the immune system with herbs like uh, oils like the conifers and uh, for calming effects as well. Now we'll talk about this more in the next one because it's about time to wrap this up, but I just wanted to give you the overview of how to use these. But then finally on this point, for the kids once they're up to about eight or nine, then you can start to use aromatherapy and essential oils more fully, but by then they should already have been on a healthy diet and they should already have been exposed to many of the basic herbs that are good for building their systems and you won't run into any of the problems with kids who are really super allergic, uh, have been on lots of medications, have acute asthma, inhalers and all that, and that's where aromatherapy gets more complicated. And that's also one of the main reasons that people are reaching out, looking for answers. You know, I, I only mentioned really the marketing side of it, but the reality is that people really need help. And so essential oils play a very, very big role in the home pharmacy. But I'm just going to wrap this up by saying uh, this is good. We need to know about how to build a home pharmacy. And the home pharmacy is very safe as long as we have the education. So all I'm advocating here is use these oils safely. Get the education you need, and this is the first step. And this information actually will go a very long way if you just be if you just use the oils carefully, don't put them directly on the skin and don't ingest them internally. That's a good starting point. If you want to do more advanced medical treatment, just get more education. But for now, let's just start with that. And so let me just make sure that I covered everything. Uh, I think, yes, I did. Uh, okay, so I think that basically we're all, we're all set here. That covers all the major points about the safe use of essential oils and also a cosmological introduction so that we can understand our biological unity with these oils and appreciate nature at an elemental and pranic intelligence level. And so with that, Paula, I'll turn it back to you. All right, David. Really, I, I appreciate this so much as an introduction. It was a very comprehensive introduction. So many people think they've used oils for a while and they don't really know. They don't need to know, you know, how they're made or what safe use is. So you covered so many things that I think are helpful. Thank you for being the, bringing this education to Hawthorne. My pleasure. Um, 
you bet. One of the first comments that we got early on was um, how fascinating it is to hear you speak of light, sunlight, and moonlight and their effect on plants. Because recent research is only just beginning to understand the importance of photons in our own human body. So it's as fascinating as it is magical. Nice comment. Thank you. Yes, that's one of the things that I love about traditional Asian medical systems is that they actually have awareness of this. They use a different language and they experienced it in a different way than uh, you know researchers in quantum physics are experiencing it. But there is a profound level of spiritual insight which goes directly into understanding how nature works in these medical systems. And this comes from the ancient spiritual teachings of uh, the Vedas, uh, which is where Ayurveda came from, and it comes from the deep meditative traditions of yoga and Qigong and uh, the way that this influenced Taoist philosophy in China. And of course, people in the shamanic traditions had their own way of experiencing this also. So I am very much an advocate of using herbal medicine for our health, but going beyond it just as a consumer and using herbal medicine as a doorway into spiritual insight by understanding what the plants are doing and how they are relating inside of us right now. So thank you. Good observation. Thank you. Okay. So back to some specifics that are coming here from our attendees and and you know I'm starting at the beginning here from where you did, David. And so back to speaking about hot and cold, when making a synergy to stimulate purification with ingredients like cardamom and clove, which would be hot, would it be counterproductive to add something like sage and vetiver? Well, let's back up here a little bit. What what exactly is m meant by stimulate purification? You see, mm -hmm. there's a lot of uh, concepts that are used in natural medicine now because uh, they've become popular. But if you look at it from a clinical perspective you have to go a little bit more deeply. What are you trying to purify? That's the first question that I would ask. Uh, is there something toxic that needs to be purified? Now essential oils do have a very significant purifying effect and there are two ways that they purify and I've mentioned them both already but I didn't actually put them in the context of purification. First of all, when we put an essential oil in a diffuser, uh, an essential oil of a conifer or a eucalyptus or anything uh, from the forest, what are we doing? We are diffusing the aromatic molecules of the forest and that will have a purifying effect on the atmosphere. Same with the flowers. We're bringing the flower fragrances into the home. Now those molecules will actually purify the atmosphere at the microbial level. They will kill atmospheric airborne pathogens. That is known. And so a diffuser will protect us from airborne pathogens. So that's one way to understand how they can purify. Okay, And all essential oils at that particular level will do that. They will attack the pathogens. But the question is, will they potentially attack our brain also? And so therefore, there's a lot of essential oils that have uh, neurotoxic effects. And so you don't want to use a high concentration of sage oil, or wintergreen oil, or birch oil, or camphor oil. That's why we need more education because there are uh, many, many oils actually that are neurotoxic. And this is one of the adverse reactions that unfortunately has been reported happening to people. I mean, the adverse reactions reports are getting very scary, very common, and very extensive. And one of the adverse reactions that people are reporting is seizures from breathing essential oils that are neurotoxic. And so when you say purify, let's also keep in mind that even though they may purify the atmosphere, they may poison our brain if we use them incorrectly. The other way that they purify is emotionally. What does that mean? Essential oils, aromatherapy, uh, is an excellent, excellent therapy for alleviating anxiety and depression. There is no doubt about it. Natural medicine can be very supportive and in many cases can uh, really make a huge impact in the quality of people's lives and mental states and emotional states. And so therefore, 
we can say that essential oils can also purify consciousness. They can purify our anxiety. They can purify our depression, our anger, and so forth. Those are the two main ways that I define purification. And so therefore, uh, going back to your question, I would have to say, well, I don't really know what you want to purify. Okay? Uh, and if you want to do a physiological detox, essential oils are not the way to do it. Okay? You can detoxify the respiratory system when there's congestion. Uh, and you can detoxify at a mental emotional level through relaxation. Um, but physiological detox of the liver, for example, essential oils is not your first choice. So the question, I'm afraid I can't really answer it, except by giving you a little bit more uh, holistic view of what I mean and what I think of when you say purification. Okay, let's do the next one. I hope that was satisfactory. All right. Uh, you know, come back to in talking about diffusers here um, and, and safety. There's been some caution around not using um, a diffuser all day long, um, having any kind of a continuous use to make sure that windows were open, to make sure children weren't around, and certainly not animals. Uh, can you speak to that? Well, it's not the diffuser. It's the type of oil that you're using, okay? And it's the size of the room. That's the, that's the main issue. Now, you don't want to put a large amount of a toxic oil in a diffuser and lock yourself up in a closed tiny space. You'll, you'll hurt yourself. But on the other hand, if you are using the general aromatherapy oils that are available for atmospheric diffusing, if you are using pure botanical oils, and again, this goes back to quality control, because we know that in public places, there's this epidemic now of synthetic fragrances. Okay. Right. You know, hotels use them. Uh, it, you know, lots of places use them. Uh, stores have their own brand identification fragrance so that every time you go in the store you'll have this subliminal message that, oh, I like the environment here. I'm in a shop and every time uh, you smell that fragrance you want to go shop there again. You know, there's a lot of psychological manipulation that's taking place with that. But that's all based on synthetics and that's why a lot of people are developing chemical sensitivity. There's so much synthetic toxin and unfortunately a lot of synthetic fragrances are also going into people's diffusers at home. But if you have a pure lavender oil, a pure eucalyptus oil, uh, safe simple essential oils in a normal diffuser in a normal sized room will not cause problems. They will give a low-grade background fragrance that really will not even be therapeutically strong enough to treat something, okay? It'll just be supportive over the long term. Now, let's use some common sense here. You don't want to put a diffuser uh, that has a continuous stream that runs continuously directly underneath your birdcage. Uh, in a closet, okay? But in general, if you have it in your living room and it's a, a decent sized space, uh, it's not going to be a problem, okay? Now, I have never heard of pets being poisoned by diffusers. I have never heard of people being poisoned by diffusers. But I have heard of people having really bad reactions to bad oils used in diffusers. And that's the main issue, okay? So just use good quality oils, common sense approach, okay? And the number one thing, if you notice any kind of sensitivity for yourself or your kids or your pets, turn it off, all right? That's the most basic thing. And that applies to everything. If your kid eats a pizza and gets gastric distress, the common sense thing is there was an adverse reaction, don't eat the pizza, okay? Same thing with essential oils. If it's giving you a headache, don't use it. So that's the, the basic common sense approach uh, to using this, but I also mention that most diffusers now don't run continuously also. They should have a timer on, so they run for 10 minutes and then they're off for 20 minutes, and that eliminates the problem as well. So that's a good, good question. I hope that's a practical answer. It was. Thank you. Um, but, it, but it comes back to the follow-up question that comes back to um, quality and how do you know? It's like get good safe oils and with all the misinformation that's coming through marketing, um, I know I, I my go-to companies and who to trust but 
for the general consumer that 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 sh shopping in general stores, how do you know if something's a hundred percent concentration? Is it you the don't. color? Is it the aroma? Is like is it their marketing? It's no, you don't. That's the problem. The retail consumer has no way of knowing, mm -hmm. and uh, not even not even companies have ways of knowing unless they have access to a million dollars worth of testing equipment and a, a staff of technicians and a lot of times unfortunately what those companies do with that uh, technology is they take advantage of it so that they can adulterate their oils okay so that you can't actually see it now the standard testing method is a gross gas chromatograph and people think well I have a chromatograph this is another marketing thing that people are told uh, if you don't have the chromatograph, it's not pure. And well, you can have a chromatograph, and you can be looking at it, and there can be all kinds of adulterated compounds in there, and you wouldn't even recognize it. Sure. Okay. You need a high level of uh, analytic chemistry education to be able to, first of all, perform uh, a chromatograph, and then to be able to interpret it. So even the testing equipment doesn't uh, work very well. So there's only one guaranteed way, and that is you know the distillers. And you have been to their farms, and you have helped them to harvest the plants, and you have put the plants in the still, and you have seen the oil coming out. And that's really the only way that you have 100% guarantee, is you know the source 100%. Because every time an oil changes hands, that's where the likelihood of contamination comes in. And some oils, I'll give another example, agarwood oil, very, very expensive. It tends to pass through 10 hands before, between uh, the distiller and the consumer. And every time it changes hands, something more is added into it to stretch it so that the profit goes up. So it's not the company. I'll say that again. It's not the company. It's the oil. Okay. And therefore, what we look for, the more expensive the oil is, the more rare it is, the smaller the yield, the more precious it is, the more likely contamination and adulteration will happen. And so what I can say is that the common essential oils, widely used, widely distilled, distilled in large amounts, low-cost oils tend to be the ones that are relatively safe. Yeah. But I'll also mention that even those oils now are getting problematic. It was recently told to me by an industry expert, for example, 60% of all lavender oil on the market now is adulterated. All right. So Very this sad. is a, it's a it's a challenge. But you know what? It's not just essential oils. It's the entire herb industry. And it's not just the herb industry, it's the entire food industry. Exactly. I'm saying the and same thing about food when we educate. Every natural resource is becoming more and more precious, harder to get, in bigger demand, and there's more contamination and adulteration. This is just a specifically unique problem that we have with essential oils because there's been this explosion of interest. And I will mention that essential oils are not thousands of years old. Okay, that's another that's another uh, marketing story. Most essential oils have only appeared in the last hundred years. Right. Distillation has been around for maybe seven or eight hundred years, but most essential oils are relatively recent. And really, the explosion of aromatherapy with all the oils that are out there now has really only happened in the last twenty years or so. And that's one of the reasons why we must be very careful. And we must really study a lot because when it comes right down to it, science and medicine don't really know a lot about these oils yet. We're just discovering them. We're just learning about them. Aromatherapy as a practice is a ways ahead than the science and the research. And it's been done for a long time without a lot of investigation into it. But at the same time, um, there's been a lot of mistakes that people have made, and there's a lot of unknowns about the oil. So now the benefit is that people are learning about essential oils, what to do and what not to do and so forth. And so I think that we are now passing through this first phase where there's been this gigantic explosion of interest in essential oils. And with that, a lot of misunderstanding about their uses. And now more and more people are getting 
higher quality education. The science is coming in. And we're learning more about what they do and they don't do. And I think over the next five or ten years, it's going to be refined quite a lot so that more and more people are getting more benefit and having less reaction and less adverse reactions. And this presentation that I gave will be much less necessary uh, than it is at this particular time. May it be so, David. Absolutely. So just to put this last question in context, they're, that they're addressing the, um, the rarity of blue tansy essential oil, and and hearing that it's in such low supply, does that correlate with its very high price? Yes, absolutely. And it also <coughs> excuse me, it also correlates with the fact that it is adulterated with a number of other blue oils, and so uh, again, finding the real thing is very difficult. It's uh, you need to have a, a lot of proof of certification. You have to know your sources really well, uh, and you also have to have the chromatographs. And it, it's a very complicated uh, business. I'll just put it that way. Uh, now, the the tansy oil I will mention has a very specific limited application in skincare products. That's it. It's very anti-inflammatory for the skin. Now, the tansy oil is actually in the class of oils that has compounds that are potentially toxic for children uh, and pregnant women or potentially for people who are on medications and so I would say don't use tansy oil uh, you know even if you have the money for it I mean it's an extremely rare expensive oil uh, if you have the money for it use it wisely use it very carefully use it very diluted and specifically for skincare products and that's that's how we use it um, but don't use it as a general aromatherapy oil. And the price helps to prevent that also. Yes, it sure does. <laughs> All right, let's get to a few more of these. Um, if we mix essential oil with another type of oil like olive oil, does the essential oil maintain its original power? Yes, it does, but there are two things to consider. That's a good question. If your primary therapeutic purpose is to uh, have, uh, let, let me see how to, how to phrase this. Okay, so if you want the primary therapeutic purpose to come from the application of the oil and the fragrance doesn't matter, then you can use any kind of carrier oil. And when you put the essential oil in, the carrier oil could have a strong fragrance and it could cover up the fragrance. But if you are treating the skin or you are treating uh, musculoskeletal problems and so forth where the fragrance is not the primary uh, therapeutic method, then it doesn't matter. On the other hand, if the fragrance is the primary therapeutic method that you are going for, then the carrier oil does matter. and this raises an interesting question. Do essential oils work? Does aromatherapy work if we can't smell essential oils? That's a common question because a lot of people actually have damaged sense of smell from medications, injury, infections, uh, many things. And so the answer to that is yes and no. It can still work. Essential oils can still work if uh, they're application is not uh, specifically needed in the olfactory system. For example, if you put tea tree oil on your toenail fungus, you don't need to smell it. It will have an antifungal effect on the nail. As a matter of fact, you probably don't want to smell it. But on the other hand, the answer is uh, no, it won't work. And that's if the therapeutic application is based on perceiving it. And that's the application of aromatherapy for the limbic system issues. For example, rose oil is renowned as an oil that can be helpful for depression and sadness, loss and grief. Well, what if you can't smell it? I would imagine you could take a very fine rose oil, you could tell your tell you know a, a relative or a friend who needs it, you could say, well rose oil could help you now. And they could get a rose oil and they could smell it and they can't smell it. And probably that would make them more depressed, okay, not less depressed. And so therefore, the olfactory benefits 
in this case, through the limbic system, for our consciousness, mind, mood, and emotions are entirely based on the pleasure of perceiving it. And if you can't perceive it, then no, it's not going to work. Now, why do I say that with a carrier oil? Because you don't want to take your very expensive fine rose oil or your neroli oil or other nice, expensive, exotic oils uh, to make a beautiful fragrance blend for mood uplifting effects and then put them in something that's going to end up smelling like a stir fry because you're not going to get the olfactory pleasure of it. So therefore, we have two main categories of carrier oils, those with strong fragrance where you don't care about the fragrance, you just put the essential oils in for the therapeutic benefit. And those that have no fragrance are very low fragrance, so you don't disturb your uh, essential oil blend at the level of enjoying it at the olfactory uh, pleasure level. So now um, people are wondering if you have suggestions for appropriate carrier oils. Well, there are so many oils and it depends on what you want to do. Uh, for the oil that has the least fragrance, you would think of something like an almond oil or coconut oil. Uh, jojoba has relatively low fragrance, but a lot of these also, it, it depends on the uh, extracting method. For example, some coconut oil uh, can have a lot of fragrance, uh, fractionated coconut has less. Mm -hmm. uh, but you know, there's, there's a lot of different carrier oils. Uh, I tend to recommend rosehip seed oil uh, for the skin, for dry inflamed skin conditions, and then Ayurveda uses sesame oil extensively, and you can get all kinds of different variations of sesame oil. So again, this is a big topic, and how about if I just include uh, an overview of different carrier oils in the therapeutic section next week? Okay, because we were, sure. were really we were really covering the safe uses, and that's more of a technical therapeutic question. But I could include a list of basic essential oils for fragrance purposes and basic essential oils for therapeutic purposes. So how about if I just continue that discussion in the next module? Sounds ideal. Okay, good. Um, I want to take us back to. Um, uh, the points you were making about essential oil for antimicrobial applications and they're wondering if there's fear around using this will we begin to have strains of bacteria MRSA for example becoming more virulent when the essential oils will not work well that's a huge subject but it's a, a very good point to raise now first of all <clears throat> I want to uh, address some of the misinformation that's coming through marketing which is that this essential oil can treat this type of infection because it has been shown to do that in a petri dish okay so there's a big misunderstanding between in vitro and in vivo in vitro means in a petri dish and that's where most of the research is happening but what's happening is that the essential oil companies are taking the in vitro information and they're trying to claim, well, you can do that in a human body. And so I gave you an example of the tea tree being able to uh, kill 67 strains of MRSA. That's in a Petri dish. And why is that? Well, you can't drink tea tree oil. and You cannot consume enough tea tree oil to, to cure MRSA. You cannot do it. That's because the range, the, uh, there's such a narrow uh, range between uh, an oil being therapeutic and an oil being toxic. Okay, so this is a huge area of research in science because if they can find a way to make essential oils emulsified, and they're looking at all kinds of different nanotechnologies of how to emulsify essential oil compounds uh, so that we can actually drink them and they will not irritate our digestive tract and they will go into the bloodstream and they will target the cells. This is a huge, huge medical physiological obstacle to using essential oils uh, as medications. But that, that's a research. That's probably the future of treating infections in, yes. uh, in some areas. Now, on the other hand, um, we, let's see, uh, remind me of the question again. I'm sorry, I sidetracked myself. Mm, and I went. To, I'm sorry. Yeah. I just went to several other questions coming up next. Okay. <laughs> well, we were talking. I deleted we were talking that about, one. I'm sorry. Okay. No problem. We were talking. We were talking about in, 
we were talking about infections. Oh, yes. And, yes, and, 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 and would um, uh, overuse of essential oil then... Oh, right, um, right. Exactly. Yeah, there you go. Okay, good. Now, uh, the interesting thing that has been found about the use of essential oils uh, against microbes is that they have a very diverse uh, mechanism of attacking uh, the microbes. So, for example, uh, the reason that bacteria can become resistant to an antibiotic drug is because uh, it can shift its genetics around to overcome that very specific mechanism that the, uh, the drug is having on the cell. On the other hand, essential oils attack the cell from all kinds of different angles simultaneously in ways that it cannot change its genetics. For example, the monoterpenes in tea tree oil um, physically degrade the cellular membrane. They actually destroy the membrane physically right, in a way that the bacteria can't re become resistant to. At the same time, when those monoterpenes embed themselves in, into the bacterial cell wall, uh, they also suck out the potassium ions. So it basically bleeds it to death, and it can't adjust to that either. And then it blocks the respiration over the cell wall, and it can't adjust to that either. So what we see then is that the essential oils contain hundreds of compounds. Each of those compounds attacks microbes in a diversity of ways. So therefore, when we use essential oils at that level, we can think of it as being attacking the microbes in hundreds of different ways simultaneously. That's a complex biological immune response. So the likelihood then of, of microbes becoming resistant to essential oils, pure complex essential oils with hundreds of compounds, is practically nothing. But on the other hand, what science wants to do, of course, is find the active ingredient. What is it in tea tree that kills the bacteria? So now they're extracting, you know, a specific compound, the, the four, uh, the terpenine for all, okay, the alcohol, uh, and they want to extract that and synthesize it and start using it as an antibacterial. And if they do that, well, the bacteria could become resistant to an isolated compound in the essential oil. But guess what they found? Doing that seriously reduces the effectiveness of uh, the antibacterial power. As a matter of fact, tea tree oil in its whole form has been found to be 10 times more powerful as an antibacterial than just taking out that one isolate, isolated compound. Okay, so I hope that's a good answer. That's These are good really cool, cool. Ex excellent good questions. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I want to try to get a few, uh, to to a few more. We got everybody staying, so <laughs> this is a okay, good sign. Great. But, okay, we'll um, keep going. Um, if they have a blend that's in a carrier oil, can they put that in a diffuser? It's already in a carrier oil. No, because that will clog up your diffuser. Yeah. And as a matter of fact, some diffusers don't do well with heavy, sticky oils at all. Like vetiver oil is very heavy right. and and sticky or Jatamanzi, the spike nard oil. Uh, so a diffuser really gets along best with the very light solvent type oils and the heavier oils can clog them up. Uh, if you have the water type of diffuser that vibrates, you can use the heavier oils a bit more safely. And you could probably use a uh, blend in a carrier oil, but it's just going to make a sticky mess. It's not going to yes. be that great. So uh, just use the pure oil. Okay. Uh, examples of conifer oil, please. I, the ones that I mentioned were spruce, pine, and fir, and we could also add juniper. So the main conifer oils that are found on the market commonly, spruce, pine, fir, and juniper, and there are many, many species of each of these. Okay, so you can find the black spruce, and you can find the silver fir, and you can find the pinon pine. Uh, and you can find the dwarf juniper. Uh, those are a few examples that I'm familiar with. Those are some of my favorite conifer oils. Okay, thank you. And I'm just staying in tree species here. Um, you were saying something about birch, and it, it cut out for her at the time, and and she's hoping that you remember. <laughs> well, I was mentioning birch oil as one of the toxic oils. I mentioned it in the discussion where I gave a list of oils. Uh, birch and wintergreen 
are almost the same chemically, but they come from different plants. Uh, the wintergreen is distilled from leaves, and the birch is distilled from uh, bark or branches from the tree. But they are almost identical in that they are almost uh, the oil consists almost entirely of um, salicylates, and salicylates are also widely found on the market. Excuse me, uh, synthetically now. And that's what gives this kind of uh, wintergreen fragrance to liniments and salves and so forth. Those oils are highly toxic. Those oils should not be used in a diffuser. They are very effective, however, in uh, musculoskeletal preparations as long as the dilution is correct and uh, it is not used for an extensive period of time. Thank you. There's just a few more questions. We'll try to get to this evening and let the rest go to the next presentation. Okay. But um, in terms of, um, uh, is a diffuser different than an oil burner? And are those safe to use, oil burners? Well, when you say oil burner, I think what you mean is <clears throat> the a little ceramic bowl that's that has a candle underneath it. I think and, so, too. Okay, so typically, uh, those, you put a little bit of water and then you put the essential oil on the water and the candle heats it. Uh, these are very ineffective and they're also somewhat dangerous because the water will evaporate and the essential oil uh, will start to get stickier and stickier at the bottom until finally you'll have a sticky mess that could actually combust. It could be flammable. So I would not advise oil burners. I would advise the basic um, nebulizing water type of diffuser for general purposes, but then there is also the forced air uh, ionizer uh, for stronger therapeutic purposes. And I can give you a little bit more information about that next week also. Uh, okay, we, can, uh, we, we can unpack that a little bit further. Uh, so I discourage the use of those oil burners. They're they're just messy and ineffective. If I understand if I understand what you're asking about. Yeah, I think so too. Um, coming back to the original question about um, um, hot and cold mixed um, mixed essences with the oils, and the original question was around purification, but the the question was really about uh, is is putting hot and cold oils, can they mixed and still be effective? Yes. Okay, good. That's a different question. And yes, they can be very effective, and that's uh, a natural part of both perfumery and therapeutic blending as well. Uh, mm -hmm. For example, a lot of times in um, musculoskeletal preparations, we find that you can uh, use a warming oil like ginger to improve uh, circulation and uh, have um, uh, you know a soothing kind of effect uh, but at the same time if you make a blend with with ginger you may also uh, want to put in something like vetiver which is also cooling uh, for muscular tension uh, and relaxing for muscular tension but it has a cooling kind of effect so a lot of times you can blend uh, hot natured oils and cold natured oils and it um, produces a good therapeutic benefit. Now keep in mind that this concept of hot and cold is only a starting point for understanding things at a very simplistic level because when you actually get into the therapeutic applications and the complexities of it metabolically and physiologically uh, it becomes very uh, complicated and the the simple rules start to break down like for example uh, Ayurveda Chinese medicine both say well ginger is hot well that's an organoleptic sensory experience you eat fresh ginger you chew on it it burns you feel warm it makes you sweat but paradoxically uh, ginger is one of the greatest anti-inflammatories so uh, how do you explain that how do you how do you explain that something that feels hot, tastes hot, makes you feel warm, actually has a cooling effect uh, in the tissue. Well, that's where the system becomes a little bit more complicated, and that's where when you start to blend hot and cold together, uh, you see that you can use other models other than hot and cold, for example. Uh, you can use things like uh, the example that I gave, 
You can also use oils because they have a relaxant effect on the muscles, not just because they're hot or cold, uh, or because they have an uh, enhancing effect on circulation, not because they're hot or cold. You see, so there are some examples of oils that are very clear and easy to understand as hot. Yeah. Now, we'll unpack that next week. Some okay. are very easy to understand as cool. A lot of them, that model doesn't work, and then we have to go to the model of the five elements. And then we also have to go to other models as well. And that's what we'll do next week. Okay, great. There's one more big question. I want to get to Nisha's here. She's just about to finish her, her studies at Hawthorne, and she's got a background in landscape architecture and plant biology. And she's never heard of, um, so she's asking, is the theory behind an oil having solar gain or moon essence strictly from Ayurvedic principles? No, this is just reality. Uh, this is just how this is just how plants live. Plants uh, uh, are solar-powered beings, and what that means is that solar energy drives photosynthesis. That's how plants get their energy is from sunlight, and so the photosynthetic process is what drives the metabolism of plants. In other words, if the sun didn't come up, the metabolism of the plants would stop. Okay, mm -hmm. uh, so that's um, the basic reality and then uh, we also find with the moon that there's very interesting research showing how uh, the full moon affects plants or the new moon affects plants and so that's also an aspect of botany okay so really what we're talking about here is uh, general science we're talking we're talking botany and we're talking uh, plant metabolism and ecophysiology those are the the fields of science where uh, the influence of the sun and the moon are part of modern understanding but you are absolutely correct the way that I framed it in terms of the plant absorbing uh, the essence of the Sun and the moon is described more in the classical Asian medical systems and very specifically it's described as plants that have a hot nature or plants that have a cooling nature and then if we look at the hot and cold polarity in the plants we can see the whole way that it lines up. Okay, so first of all, uh, in the cosmological or celestial realm, it's the sun and the moon, and then in the plant world, it's the tendency for the plant to have a heating or a cooling physiological effect. In other words, is it more stimulant or more relaxant? Okay, is it more drying or more hydrating? And that is the basic polarity that is then translated into the physiology of the body at the treatment level and that correlates primarily with the autonomic nervous system. Hot, solar, stimulant, drying connects to stimulation of the sympathetic nervous system which heats the body and dries it out. Okay, So there's that chain of parallels but on the other hand moon, cooling, watery, hydrating connects to parasympathetic which means relaxing and basically rehydrating and rejuvenating to the fluids so we can actually see that entire cosmology moving from the uh, celestial realm through the plant realm into herbal language into human physiology so I hope that explains it a little bit better wonderful that's, yes thank you very much and I'll, I'll, I'll I'll close the Q&A period. Just, there's a number of questions about good books on uh, use of essential oils and we're directing them to the Floricopia website where you've got several listed so we're assuming you think they're good ones. <laughs> and um, one addition was added here of the um, clinical aromatherapy as being a suggested text. And I, I also just want to say I appreciate um, how comprehensive this presentation was and um, and I want to just say what, how highly I think of your company, Floricopia, um, not just for the, the quality of the essential oils, but the quality of the education that you continually provide and, and update. There's very science-based and, and very practical-based, and so I appreciate that for you so much, and I'm looking forward to you coming back here in two weeks on January 17th and continuing this conversation and telling us a little bit more about the applications and how they correlate with this information that you shared this evening. So I want to thank you so much, David, for it was really brilliant. Um, a, a very thorough, comprehensive presentation tonight that certainly helped me, and I'm trusting that'll be so for many people.
Well, thank you so much for the complimentary words and for the invitation. And thank you to everybody who has joined us. Yeah. We'll be back here on the 17th. We'll start again at 3.50 Pacific time with some general announcements and we'll go live at 4 o'clock. And just a reminder that tomorrow we've got um, our All About Alumni and we've got a, a, a Rebecca Katz presenting. That's at 12 noon and we hope that you'll join us for that too. And just a reminder that there's a survey that, um, that you'll receive after this closes out. So help us by filling that out and we'll see you back here tomorrow and, and again in a couple of weeks. Thanks again, David. Thank you. Bye for now.